Hello, everybody, and welcome back. This is the first time I've done this intro. My name is Will Crosby, and this is a local chat. Uh, episode 25 for uh, June 24th, 2021. I always forget to do that, and I always forget to introduce myself. Joining me today is the one and only Ian Gibson. Hi, welcome back. Uh, sorry we missed an episode last week, but we've got two weeks worth of games and an E3 to talk about. It's going to be a great show, everybody. Does that every single time. Um, it's just the two of us this week. Kyle to drop off. He, it's on assignment, as they usually say on podcasts. <laughs> um, so that's okay. It's just the two of us. Just the two of us. Uh, we're going to hang out, talk about some games, and, um, you know, touch each other. So uh, let's get into it. Um, Ian. I've never been more excited <laughs> to be on a podcast and not a visual medium. <laughs> never been a better time. Um, <laughs> What you been playing? Hit me. Hit me hard. Well, I was I was out last week. Um, I went down to Florida to see some family, but also to play a game called the U.S. Housing Market. Um, folks, it's insane out there. Long story short, my fiance and I are planning to move to Jacksonville, Florida and buy our very first house. And um, Will, are you aware of how crazy the housing market is right now? Uh I have heard it is a little bit insane. A little bit. Let me let me give you some some anecdotal. I have like four or five like I don't know. So it's first hand if it happens to you, but it's second hand if it happens to somebody you know and they tell you about it. Is that how it goes? I I think so. But if okay. you sit These on are... your hand, it's the stranger. <laughs> <laughs> it's the stranger. <laughs> Okay, here it is. Here it is, folks. So basically, normally in a normal market, houses are on the market for about 45 days before they actually are sold. And that's mm -hmm. not closing. That's that's before the seller accepts somebody's offer. And the other thing is the offer is more of a negotiation. So somebody lists their house for $300,000. Somebody comes along and says, I'll pay two eighty five, dollars And the seller goes, well, how about two ninety? dollars And they go, okay. And then they shake hands and that's a deal, right? So 45 days and there's negotiation. Um, my parents sold their house in September. They had seven offers within 48 hours. Whoa. And all of them were above their asking price. So they asked a certain amount of money and every single one came in between twenty to $75,000 above their asking price. Cheapers. That was in September. It's even worse now. Um, we were looking at new home construction back in March and the way that new houses typically work is that you go to a builder, they're building a whole neighborhood and you say, hello, show me what you've got. And they say, well, this house is this money. This house is this money plus $10,000 because it has a nicer, nicer kitchen. Would you like it? And you say, great. And you shake hands and they go, it'll be done in three months. Um, we couldn't even get them to return our phone calls. Like, wow. you know, let's say. There's like 15 different neighborhoods we were trying to look at. We got a response from two of them. And um, the way they're doing it now is basically you go in and they say, look, these are the houses. We don't know when they're done. But at some point, we will open an, a, a, a bidding system. The starting price is X amount of money, which is already inflated. And you need to beat that price along with everybody else that's putting in an offer. And then we pick from those which one we like. So you can't even like buy a new house basically you have to yeah. go up against this blind auction system um my the people that my parents sold their house to they said this is not an exaggeration they said they had put in that was about their 30th offer for a house um wow. and just yeah just to be clear every time you make an offer you sign a legal piece of paper that says like i am offering you this much money it's not something you do willy-nilly right and they had a text message Exactly, yeah. So they had 20 plus offers denied over several months before my parents finally sold them our house. You know, they were on the market for crazy. My, uh, our real estate agent, who is our buyer's agent, is also a seller's agent. So somebody she was selling a house for, they had an open house. And within the next day, they had 27 offers on the house. Um, so long story short, if you have a house that you want to sell, it's a great time to sell it <laughs> because basically you pick an inflated number and people will come in and immediately offer you 50000 above that. Um, if you're trying to buy a house like I am, it's a terrible time because basically houses that were, you know, a good price 
a year ago or even a couple months ago are now $25,000, dollars $70,000 above that price. Plus, when you bid on the house or put an offer in, you've got to add on top of that because you're fighting against other people. Um, so basically, we went to Florida with this nightmare <laughs> scenario of going, we need to move to Florida by the end of the year. We need a house. Yeah. We need to start looking at houses now. We need to start putting offers in now because it may literally take us months and a dozen plus offers before we finally get a house. And the worst case scenario is we have to move from our current place, which is a rental, to a new rental in Florida at the end of the year and keep looking for houses and turn one move into two moves. It was just a nightmare, right? Yeah. So um, I know this is a story time, but folks, it's a story. <laughs> so we get so we get down there on Monday. Monday night, we start looking at houses. The problem was because houses are on the market for like two to three days on average now before the seller accepts an offer, at which point like you can't do anything. You just have to hope the offer that's, falls through and it comes back on the market. That's what the 45 days was before. 45 days is now is now I think I think the actual market average is like five to seven days. But in Jeez. Florida, in Jacksonville, it's two to three days. Um so we we couldn't even prepare. It's not like we could before we went down to Florida pick houses to look at because by the time we got down there, they weren't available anymore. Um, so we get down there Monday, and Monday we sit down and we pick like seven or eight houses that we want to look at. We send mm -hmm. it to our agent. She gets three showings. All the others were like under contract. We don't have showings available for a week or like no response from the agent, which basically means house is already taken. They don't need to deal with you. Right. So we go to three showings the next day. First house is overpriced and it needs like 60,000 in renovation before we can even move in because it was just trashed. Um, second house was really, really nice. It was freshly renovated. It was a little, it was a little expensive. Plus we knew it would be popular and Maggie didn't like it. It was a little small. Yeah. So we didn't do that house. Third house we see Maggie really likes. I like it. I'm not crazy about it, but I like it. The weird thing is this house has been on the market for 12 days. Oh. So we're like, Bad we're like what's going on? We're like, <laughs> we want to put an offer in because we like the price. We like the house. But why is it on the market for 12 days? And our agent is fantastic. You ever need to buy a house in Jacksonville or sell a house? Seriously, agent, my agent's fantastic. She was my parents' agent, my sister's agent. She's friends of the family. She's incredible. Anyways. She goes, well, what I like to do is I like to call the seller's agent before I put in an offer and ask them what the sellers want. Do they care about money? Do they care about closing as quickly as possible? Do they care about repairs? Like they don't want to do any repairs to the house before they sell it, things like that. And when I'm there, I'm going to ask them why it's on the market for 12 days. And I was like, okay. So she calls them and she calls us back and she goes, if they're telling me the truth, the reason why it's on the market for 12 days is because they didn't have an open house for like the first week. And so typically if you look at a listing and it says open house on Friday, mm -hmm. you don't schedule a showing. You just wait till the open house. Right. Right. The other problem was the open house was two days before we went there. And she said, according to them, like 30 people had shown up at the open house and all of them had told the agent in full view of everybody else that they were going to make an offer on the house. And so all of them scared each other away. Because <laughs> think about it. If you hear 20 other people saying they're going to make an offer on the house, you got to look at the asking price and go, I can't bid less than 70000 over that. Yeah. Because some, some idiot's going to come in and bid over that. You know? So none of them put in an offer on the house, right? And then she's like, the other thing these people want is they're trying to save money because they can't really afford the house anymore. And they, they don't want to move out yet. They want a delayed closing and most people want to move in as quickly as possible for Mackie and I, it's perfect because yeah. we can't move till September anyways. That's great. Long story short, long story short, we put in an offer. We put 15, we offer 15 over the asking price, which was kind of low. Anyways, we put 5,000 towards their closing costs, which I think may take almost all of their closing costs. So basically it's like no out of pocket for the seller and they get to pick the closing date. 11 AM the next morning, they agree to it. Folks, I bought a house. I bought hey! a house in one day. Yes. Woo! That's awesome. In this market. It's crazy. So we we got a purchase agreement signed. We got the mortgage going. Jeez. It's just like paperwork. The appraisal was this morning. I don't know what the appraisal came in because if the appraisal is less than 
our mortgage amount, then we may have to put pay more for down payment. But the inspection was fine. There was like very minimal repairs. That's awesome. So it's just like, we got a house. <laughs> I didn't I... know this was going to end this way. <laughs> <laughs> the U.S. housing market, I'm officially a speed runner as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> That's this fantastic. Is like, yeah. If you talk to any realtor, they say like, this is literally the worst market it's ever been for a, house, for a home buyer in the U.S. And we went in there one day, three showings, one offer done. And it's just like, that's awesome. So I will say, um, just to bring it back to Subpixel, it's the house is so good that I'm going to have a home office for my day job and a completely separate Subpixel office. Yeah. I get both, baby. Um, and I don't want to jinx it. I don't want to jinx it. But fingers crossed, Extra Life 2022 next year, maybe in Florida. <gasps> live Hot tub Florida. stream. <laughs> Do I have, I have a big tub. So get a pool. Uh, so long story short, I bought a house and you gotta, it's going to be fantastic. You gotta crazy, send me crazy vacation. Yeah. I'll send you the address. I'll say yeah. it right now on stream. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> yeah, because... definitely. Cause Karen's going to want immediately yeah. ask for the showing. So please message that to me. Yeah. That's incredible. I'm so happy for you. <clears throat> it's crazy. Like our real estate agent was like when she, Basically, from the time that she spoke to the seller's agent up till now, she was like flabbergasted. She was like, this is not supposed to happen in this market. This is a very unique opportunity. And she was like, and then when she called us to tell us that the offer had been accepted, she was like, I cannot believe this. This is not <laughs> supposed to happen. But you guys have a house. And we're like, crazy. That's you awesome. Know? That's so Yeah, because awesome. she, has, she has other clients that have been looking for months that keep putting offers in. And they just can't compete against people. And we we were able to just waltz in there, put an offer down, and and we're. I feel like the happy. amount that you have mentioned to me the not anxiety, but how not looking forward to finding a house you were, like leading up to this moment yeah. that I was expecting you to have to go through hell, and now that you yeah. haven't, I feel like I need we need to do something to make you go through hell because you don't deserve <laughs> this. Well, I've still got, there's all this paperwork. And the other thing is, uh, it turns out buying a house is expensive. Really? And it's not, and it's not just like the down payment. And it's not just like, you now have a mortgage. It's like literally the day that I signed the purchase agreement, I had to put, I had to go to the bank and get a check for $4,000 as a good faith deposit and put it yeah. down. And then, and then like the next day they're like, okay, schedule your inspection. And it's like 600 bucks on the inspection. And then it's like, well, you need a, a termite inspection, another $175. It's just like all these little expenses that just immediately are like, boom, 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 boom. And like the house is in very good condition, but we noticed, for example, there's two tree branches that are overhanging a fence and it's a hurricane place. So like, we're going to have those lopped off as soon as we get in. And it's like, okay, well, that's going to be a couple hundred bucks as soon as we move in. Um, there's other things like one of the fences is rotted out. So it's like, okay, we're in the new fence within a year. The home doesn't have gutters, which is which is causing some issues. It's not that uncommon in Florida, but it, it's causing some issues. So we're like, okay, as soon as we get in, we're gonna have to spend like two thousand dollars on gutters. So yeah. it's like, like the actual cost of the home and the mortgage, because the mortgage rates are so low right now, is not that bad. But it's just like immediately, it's all these like maintenance costs we immediately have to put in on top of like all the weird little expenditures around the loan and stuff. So that's awesome, though. Um, I'm very excited. Wrap it back around. To, yeah, thank you. So to wrap it, wrap around, wrap it back around to video games, it means that I'm in a weird place where I was planning to buy Ratchet and Clank. I don't want to buy it right now. I'm like, I'm not poor, but I'm literally just trying to pinch pennies as much as possible because I spent $5,000 on a house already in the <laughs> last week, you know? <laughs> so it's like, okay, I'm like, what's on Game Pass? What can I play? And I came home and I was like, I, it was both like, I come back from a vacation. You ever have this? You come back from a vacation or a time when you don't have your main gaming access and you just want to play every video game in the world? Yeah. Yeah. Like I came home and I was like, I'm going to play iRacing. I'm going to play Rim World. I'm going to play Dwarf Fortress. I'm going to play Minecraft. <laughs> I'm going to play Roblox. I was like, I'm going to play everything. Um, and I landed on Factorio because we can't stop of talking course. about it. But well, I have some good news. What's your good news? I've played about four hours of Factorial this week. And I think I'm done. You're done? 
I didn't beat the game, but what I mean is that I think I have played so much Factorio in the entirety of my life that things are not drastically different. I feel like I'm just doing the same thing over. Yeah. You know? And I went into it being like, I'm going to do things different this time. I'm not going to use blueprints. I'm going to have to design my own stuff. But it's still so similar that I think I'm done with Factorio. Not in a bad way. It just means I've kicked the habit because the high is no longer high. You know? I'm not getting a buzz anymore. Yeah. I feel great. I, I feel like... I feel like I'm not there with it because I've I've never I've never beaten Factory to begin with. Mm-hmm. I've never mm-hmm. like I've spent a lot not a lot of hours in it, but <clears throat> I I definitely know what you're talking about. That's like me and uh yeah like Civilization Five. Like I've played that enough where I'm like yeah. I don't really want to touch it ever again. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So I, I'm kind of I was dabbling around a little bit. Um. I've been playing a little bit of Wreckfest. Um, Ooh. have you played any Wreckfest? Uh I want that's next car game, right? Yeah, which is it's basically like the new iteration of Flat Out, if you ever played Flat Out or Flat Out. I feel out like too. I played it a little bit when it it's when someone's like, house. like an open alpha or something like I that. I think Zach has it. I might have played it at his place. Yeah. Visiting one it's time. Like like that game is so good and the reason why it's so good especially multiplayer is like 99 percent of multiplayer car games it's not about racing fast it's about like bumping each other like even if you consider yourself a clean racer you're still gonna nudge people out of the way right yeah or slam into them in the corners even in a game like forza where you're not supposed to do that if ghosting isn't on on the server you're gonna start nudging people and crashing into them. um but the problem is, like, in those games, you can do that and get away with it. Like, there's no penalty, basically. But, like, Wreckfest is so good because it has a very good damage model that is, like, perfectly between realistic and arcadey. So, like, like if you take somebody, if you bump into somebody, but you do too much damage to yourself, then your wheel's wonky, and you're going slow for the rest of the race. There's also um, kind of like a burnout thing where you can get wrecked, Mm-hmm. but you basically have a health meter and if it goes all the way down during the race then you're you're done with the race you have to sit there for the rest of the race um so it's one of those things where it's like yeah you can have fun wrecking other people and i like to play on these servers that are literally just like dirty racing no rules so there's some people who will get a big truck and they'll drive around the track backwards just trying to wreck you um <laughs> but the other part of it is that the racing feels so good yeah. Like it's slightly more realistic than arcadey. So like you actually do have to like do weight transfers. You know, your back end kicks out a little bit around the corners. They have like a very rudimentary tuning uh, menu, but it's cool. Like you go in, you go, oh, this is a dirt track. So I'm going to do like slightly softer suspension or it's a short track. So I'm going to change my gearing. So I have more acceleration versus top speed. And it just feels so good to be like sliding around these tracks and like bumping into people. And I usually do it mostly clean, but sometimes I like I'll come up on somebody And they're on the outside of a turn and I'll just be like, thanks. And I like use them as a guardrail to go around (laughs) or, you know, every now and then like somebody far above screws up and ends up sideways. And I'm just like, I'm sorry, buddy. I got to T-bone you at 80 miles per hour. (laughs) You know, I say that every week, like every week. (laughs) So it's just like the perfect, it's like the perfect arcade racing game for me, at least because it has like the handling feels realistic enough that there's like a challenge to it. But at the same time, if you just want to have fun and wreck people, it's there as well. And if other people try and wreck you, there's enough of a feeling that you can, like if they try to pit maneuver you, you can push them back. Or you know that even if they slammed into you, they're taking almost as much damage as you did. So just things like that. So it's just a fantastic podcast game. Put that on, hop on a server, and just have fun for a bit. Thanks. Is that on Game Pass? I don't know. I have it on Steam. Gotcha. Um, I, I would highly recommend it. If it's 20 bucks or less, hop on it. The campaign seems like the AI is okay, but it's just those multiplayer servers. That's just a lot of fun. So if you like Destruction Derby, if you like the old flat out games, if you like uh, Burnout Racing, but you want it to be a slightly more like realistic, if you like Dirt Rally Racing a little bit, if you mm-hmm. just like Americana, because a lot of it is just like American muscle cars with like hundred dollar paint jobs you know (laughs) just like has this real dirt look to it that i love dirt as in like american south redneck look that's great (laughs) um so to close out my 20 minute opening spiel mass effect 3 i've started it i'm only about an hour in uh that's pretty much it i I don't have much to say so far Uh, you haven't played it right 
I have not. I've watched about six or seven hours of the Giant Bomb playthrough. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if you wanted to play it, now would be a great time because it is on Game Pass. Not Legendary. It isn't, though. No, but I don't Just think regular. there's much difference between Legendary and Mass Effect 3. Yeah. There can't be that much difference. Yeah, I, I, I have real no no real interest in playing it, to be honest. I'm just curious to see what a lot of people trash Mass Effect 3, but I think so far my opinions have been slightly different from the norm on Mass Effect. So I'm I'm curious to see what uh, my I'm actually curious to see what is. all that stuff is, but I'll probably end up watching it because it's easier. Yeah. Um, great. That's awesome. Um, over to me. News time. Oh, wow. That was rude. Uh, I, I had a week, folks. I had to lie to you for a week and not tell you I bought a house. I can't believe that. And that, and because uh, we were just talking the other day, we were like, "Yeah, I'm probably not going to get Mario Golf." I was like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> oh well, the other thing is it's not reviewing that well. So. <laughs> oh no. Um. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'm still going to get it because I love golf games. Um. I started Dragon Warrior One, otherwise known as Dragon Quest One. Uh, on my NES oh. Classic. Um, is Dragon Warrior, is that the Japanese to English, or is that the original English name? That is the localized English name, because they thought Warrior sounded better. I can't remember exactly why. And it's, and it's one... It's like one through one comp- five is Warrior. Um, but which ones came out in the... Excuse me, which the, ones came out in the U.S., all of them? They're, yeah, they're all the same, except for... I think 10 is like the MMO, which is not in america it's not global um, gotcha yeah it's not like final fantasy um so this is pretty good uh my only issue with it is it is so grindy because it's an nes game and it was meant to fill hours and hours when you oh. were a child um yeah yeah it is so grindy um so i've i've actually been listening to podcasts while playing it and I just like walk in a circle. It's like Pokemon random encounters. Oh, so I just boy. walk in a circle and then fight things. And thank God, be, thank God I'm on done. the NES Classic because I'm just, I can just hit the reset button and save. I don't have to walk minute, all the way back. This is your, you chose this as your next JRPG? Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to hit one because it says the total time is like nine hours. It's, it's not much. Oh, okay. It's like super fast. Uh, I just want to see what one was because one is the first, I believe it is the first JRPG. Um, It is, I talked about this, I think I talked about this last week, which I shouldn't talk about it much this week, but it is so Ultima, uh, like original Ultima, that it is like crazy. Like Mm -hmm. you like hit the button, you walk over to the stairs, you hit, the menu to select stairs to go through the stairs. Like you walk up to people, hit the menu oh. to hit talk and then talk to people. Um, gotcha. All that sort of stuff. Uh, moving on. Uh, Kerbal played a bunch leading up to the uh, stream. That's still fun. I played about an hour today, testing out some new rockets, testing out the new maneuver system they came out with, which is pretty interesting. I've heard from a lot of, Kerbal experts it's not as great as they were hoping but it is good for like someone who's just playing the game for fun um it does like maneuver windows so it like it picks the best maneuver and time to save you the most delta v so like i warped and you can set alarms so i warped the alarm and i thought it messed up because my guy was just going around Kerbal like a thousand times but it's because it's going to the right date to launch to the moon when when it's yeah Um, when it's lined up yeah which was interesting uh i started psychonauts the other night uh while i was bored uh it i mean first of all it looks really good up up resed on the xbox um the textures don't look good but the graphics look good (laughs) um the and the pre-rendered cutscenes do not look good uh i got to like the main i got past most of the tutorial stuff and into the main hub um i was kind of down on it on the discord i i think i'm gonna keep playing it um i can see where all the nostalgia and love for it is because it it's it's very in your face with its style up front uh and i think a lot of people like that especially growing up so um 
I'll definitely check that out some more. But the game I've been playing the most this week is 2017's Breath of the Wild. Uh, I think I've explained... before, Before you dive into this, give us a brief primer on your background with Breath of the Wild. And also, is this a continuation of a previous save or is this a fresh start? Fresh start. I'll I'll say that right off the top. My, I think I said this last week as well. Uh, my Breath of the Wild. Hey, I won't. I see save data in the chat. I won't talk smack about Psychonauts. I, I'm enjoying it. He missed but, it. He was. He did no, it all at the beginning before you joined. Yeah, yeah. Smack, smack. Um. So Breath of the Wild. I bought it for the Wii U. Uh, physical. I ordered it. And then it didn't arrive on the day it came out. So I also bought it digitally. Played about 45 hours on the Wii U. Um, 40 to 45. Uh, then I moved to... No, that's not even true. Then I bought a Switch. Then I bought it for the Switch. Then I mo- started again on the Switch. Then I moved to New Jersey. Please don't fake fall asleep. And in the move, since all my stuff was packed up and everything, I just, like, I didn't play it, even though it's the most yeah. portable console. I just didn't touch it. So since probably April 2017, I have not touched Breath of the Wild, other than, like, occasionally loading it up when I've been drinking, and I'm like, oh, I should play Breath of the Wild again. Um, So starting... Two days ago, I just restarted the game from the beginning on the Switch. Um, and then I played it all day during work. Uh, well, not during work, but I have 30-minute breaks throughout the day. So, like, for 25 minutes of those 30-minute breaks, I could just play it a little bit. And it was nice because then I could put it down. I have to do all my work stuff, and then I can just pick it up again after the session. Um, yeah, Switch is great for that. Yeah, it's fantastic. And then today I played about six hours. I just like sat down and I was like, oh, I'll play this for a little bit. And then I just kept playing. Uh, it's so good. It's better than I remember it being. And I'm also discovering a lot of stuff I never discovered the first time around. Um, yeah. Not that I mainlined it the first time, but it's just that type of game. You discover so much stuff. And I have forgotten way more than I thought I had. Like I'm, I'm remembering it when it's happening, but I've completely tuned out mm-hmm. things and, and definitely finding things I've never seen before. Um, so I, I'm very much enjoying it and uh, I'm playing the heck out of it. So uh, get excited for our timely Breath of the Wild Will Crosby review uh, when I finish it. Uh, yeah. People are going to love that. So. I, you know, seeing that Breath of the Wild 2 stuff, I had an urge to play Breath of the Wild, but if Breath of the Wild 2 comes out next year, which is my hunch, I kind of, I think I'm just going to wait for that. Because I honestly, I think I remember a lot of what I did in Breath of the Wild because a lot of it was so memorable for me. And so like sitting here, I could probably make a list of 30, 40 things in that game. Um, So I just, I don't think, I think it's too fresh for me to go back and I've got Breath of the Wild 2 coming up. Otherwise I would definitely... Yeah, be playing some more of that game. Uh, yeah, um, I, think... I, I would give you, I would give you one tip though. Um, if you feel like you're starting to, the one of the weird things about Breath of the Wild is that there's not a whole lot of like specifically story content, but there's a lot outside of that. So it's very easy to spend hundreds of hours in that game and not touch the story. And I would say the only thing about that is, you could start to get tired of the game. And so my recommendation is not to mainline the story content, but but just get m- the story content out of the way so that as soon as you start to feel tired, you can beat Ganon and finish the game. Yeah. Um, because I know for me, that's kind of how I did it unintentionally. And it really helped because I think I was done with the game basically by the time I beat Ganon after like 60, 70 hours. And and if I had gotten to 60, 70 hours and done all this stuff, but hadn't done the story, I, it wouldn't have carried me through. So it's, it's one of those things where it's like, don't mainline the story, but try to make your way towards the four dungeons, get those done and then do whatever you want. And then when you're starting to wane on excitement, hit up Ganon. Yeah, definitely. And the, when I played it before, I, I either did two or three of the, the beasts. Uh, I was definitely like mainlining the story when I was doing that. Um, and the same, like, 
yeah, Breath of the Wild 2 comes out probably next year. Um, but I, I'm so far removed just by way of not remembering anything. And it's early enough in this year that I think I think I'll be okay um, playing it again or for the first time. Um, yeah, I, I, I do say... have just one more snarky thing to say is that. I think it's just important to remember that if I'm not mistaken, Horizon Zero Dawn came out like a week before Breath of the Wild. And I love the dichotomy between those two games because I think Horizon Zero Dawn is a very well executed open world game of that time and breath of the wild was a very well executed open world game of the future yeah and i just love keeping that in mind because both of those are very well received and i think horizon zero dawn honestly gets too much praise considering that they they didn't innovate enough and it's 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 kind of hard to keep that in your mind but realize those games were basically developed at the exact same time and one was looking forward and the other was looking towards the present. And that makes Breath of the Wild that much better that it was able to do all those things when, like to innovate in all these places when they could have just done what everybody else was doing and still gotten a fantastic game out of it like they did Horizon. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's the main thing is this game does so many things perfectly and moves the genre forward. Even yeah. uh, as hotly contested as weapon durability is, it's still a new thing that works very well like the whole system's good because they back it up by being able to change your weapons quickly all that sort of stuff so i'm very much looking forward to how they improve that system for two um that's a lot of things i'm looking at now is like how are they going to improve for two how are they going to improve for two um just like making those mental lists to see if they they can really do that um the one thing i was going to say is this game man it it look it looks a lot worse than i remember but now that I'm about six hours in, I'm like my eyes have adjusted back to it. But there's so yeah. much uh, aliasing on everything and pop in. And it's especially because I'm playing there's on a, a 4K like, TV. There's a lot of like empty space, too. Yeah. Um, and I remember when you're like when you're when you're fighting enemies and one of them lights the grass on fire, it's like, welcome to 20 frames per second, <laughs> yeah. you know? So I, I'm definitely so, excited to see how they improve for two for sure. Um, Switch Pro. Switch I will Pro. buy Switch Pro for Breath of the Wild too. Oh, 100%. 100%. Um, but yeah, so stay tuned for updates about that. I, uh, yeah, I, I loved that game when I played it four years ago uh, and I am loving it. I like literally it did not get bored at all today of it, which is crazy. Um, um, just one last story. I completely relate to it when you said that you played it for like six, seven hours straight the other day. I remember when I was playing this game, um, I don't think I'd met Maggie yet. So I was just like a bachelor living at home. And one day I was just like playing Breath of the Wild and I had an urge to build a blanket fort. So I just built a blanket <laughs> fort in my living room and I got inside of it just me and my one bedroom Baltimore apartment. And I played breath of the wild. I think I only played it for three hours straight because then I had to put it on the charger, but then I got back in the, I got back in the blanket for it after <laughs> it came off the charger. It was just this, like this moment where I was like, this game encourages like exploration and creativity. And like, um, another word I can't remember so much that it reminds me of like being a kid, reading a good book, you know? And I was like, I just had to build a blanket for it. It was just, just yeah. an incredible game. Yeah. Incredible. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Not much else other than that. I'm making good progress on my boat model. Um, mm. as well as I hit up a, uh, used book store last weekend and I bought mm. four books all about Arctic exploration, like different tales of stuff. And then, uh, a couple other, uh, books as well so that was very exciting i know it's not game there's related there's gotta but... be there's gotta be a ship slash arctic themed fiasco playset. oh there's gotta be that would be a pretty good one that's a lot of good noises yeah we'll make one yeah we should do that isn't. uh if yep. not we can come up with one uh Moving on, folks, it's time for the hot, hot news, which means we get to play our one and only news theme sung by the great 
Zach Schneider, I think is his last name from Save Data. I've never, I never think about it. Um, not the director. Nope, you're just not going to play. Wait, that's not his name, is it? It's it's not. Wait, who are you talking about I, now? I'm gonna look it up because I think I had to. I had to. It was part of mini game game show, I believe, and so I had to <laughs> put it on an overlay. Okay, well, you're looking that up. Let me play the music. Here's the news. We're talking about news. It's gaming news. What's up, news? Now, fun fact about the man who sang that song. Loves Breath of the Wild. Uh, moving on, news this week. Uh, there's a lot of it. Uh, we're going to try something a little there's different. There's a lot of it. There's six stories here. <laughs> I was being facetious. But people don't understand that because they can't see the news document. There's like six stories also be, here. Also because you say that every week and we typically do have a lot of news stories. You know what? You try being a podcast host. Uh, 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 moving on folks have you ever thought about peanuts <laughs> where do they come from do they... today we're here with <laughs> billy joe who's also a peanut farmer when he's not selling out madison square garden <laughs> that voice changed halfway through new that. york state of peanut um <laughs> 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 oh, I can't even. Oh, folks, um, we got news. We're gonna talk about news. It's gaming news. First up, Ian, have you been following the escapade of this possibly Hideo Kojima Silent Hill video game? Yes, I love. Okay, look. Uh, before I recap it, I just want to say I love how this is. This story has gained so much attention that there are not just like. Uh, net weebs like digging into this and pulling out random pieces of information there's actually investigative journalists uh like polygon kotaku i believe jason schreier also did an article on it um pulling out actual pieces of information and even with all that investigative reporting reporting both like reputable and non-reputable i still don't i don't i'm not certain Will, give me the rundown on this. Um, so this game called Abandoned premiered at the um, PS5 Direct thing they did a while back. Um, and so this trailer came out. And if if correct me if I'm wrong, but when the trailer first came out, people already said it looked like a Hideo Kojima thing because it's a first-person walking sim that's a horror game. I distinctly yeah, remember yeah. an article coming out being like, people think this is Hideo Kojima's new game. Well, um, I think I think there were a couple of things leading to that. Number one was it does kind of have like the same like color grading and look and feel as PT. Um, number two, the studio is like completely unknown. The developer at the time was completely unknown. And it was in a PS5 showcase. And the other thing was like, it didn't look that great. So it's all of a sudden like, why are they showing this from a complete nobody? Yeah. And that that led to some questions right there. So this followed up by the Blue Box Game Studios is the name of the studio. They then tweeted a cryptic tweet saying, guess the name, abandoned equals first letter S, last letter L. Which, um, I don't know, Ian, as a stupid man, what do you think that is? Stalker. <laughs> Super Mario. <laughs> yeah, and then oh, just to add, there's all these rumors going around that there are like multiple Silent Hill games in development. Yes, that is ju random just random places. I feel like that's a rumor all the time forever. Yes, is that there's a yes. Silent Hill game. And so it and then we need to add some context here. Not that I want to spend 20 minutes recapping this, but uh, Hideo Kojima did have the Phantom Pain, which was basically a fake game from a fake studio and yes. a fake game developer that turned out to be and Metal Gear Solid. V. Metal Gear Solid 2, famously, they never showed Raiden. They yep. put Snake in all those cutscenes. Um, so then um, there was the game studio director Hassan Kar Karaman 
Um, and if you put that name apparently into Google Translate, it translates to Hideo, which people were trying to confirm, and I don't think it actually does that. Um, but initials HK. Oh, true. Um, and then he also has a YouTube channel called 2727, and Silent Hills, which was PT, was canceled on April 27th. Um, also, Jeff Keeley follows the studio on Twitter. And then, yep. yeah, as you mentioned, the biggest evidence for this is the whole Metal Gear Solid 5 thing. Also, Jeff Keeley tweeted at them saying, looking forward to this. The best one I saw was um, in that Death Stranding director's cut video. He dumps out a box of oranges and the opposite of orange is blue. So it's a blue box. <laughs> <laughs> I, will say, I absolutely there's, lost it there's one more piece of semi-compelling evidence and it's that this is a complete no-name studio working on I, I don't think it's their first game but it game doesn't look great it doesn't look bad but there's like nothing there right now and yet they're showing up on a ps5 showcase but they're also being allowed to release not a demo on the ps5 store but a weird downloadable application that basically runs the trailer in real time in engine on your ps5 and that's a very weird like demo application yeah so for sony to allow that points to like some side of relationship or it's like evidence towards some sort of positive relationship or connection they would 100 do that for kojima no questions asked but for some randy random indie studio making like their first big game that doesn't even look that good and there's nothing there yet why would they allow them to to release this weird little thing it's it's just what, yeah. what's your give me your give me give me your judgment give me your judgment. i mean i i don't think it's hideo kojima if anything mystical i think it is sony making a new silent hill game and because people have started pushing towards kojima they got cold feet and they're trying to call it off because kojima work, doesn't work yeah. with konami anymore and they don't want to step on toes so they're trying to call it off but the other 50 percent of me thinks this is an indie developer who was tweeting to be funny and then they were trying to, then they were trying to back off and then they were just taking advantage of all the press. Uh, yeah. Which makes a lot more sense. Um, well, I, I, I think I, the only thing I would say is, so there's, there's some other pieces of information, which is that the developer who people didn't know and they thought was Hideo Kojima as a fake name has done interviews now and has shown his face and has done video interviews. So as far as we know, it's a real person. And um, the other thing is, I, I don't think the studio is doing this deliberately. I think, because they're not even really taking advantage of the media that well, I think they're just stuck in this weird maelstrom. And they're yeah. just kind of, I don't want to say floundering there, but they're just like, guys, we promise it's not us. And it's, the, you know, they can't stop it at this point. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so. Je Jeff Grubb tweeted a bunch of stuff about how Kojima is rumored to be working with microsoft about publishing his next game which was also rumored because of the kojima character next to the xbox sign on phil spencer's thing so he i mean jeff grubb is confirming yeah. that that is what is happening but he is confirming it as a rumor i i should say um yeah it has yeah. never so been I formally think, announced so who knows i think this is this is a weird like this is a weird like easter egg hunt slash like down the rabbit hole slash non-existent arc that yeah. people are really going after but at the same time, I can't really blame them because Hideo Kojima has deliberately done that multiple times in the past. He's hidden things just like this. So if he's, it's almost encouraging people to dig in. And now they're digging into it. And I want to be clear, as far as I can tell, nobody's gotten hurt, right? Because yeah. this studio, who, again, a hot take here, again, doesn't look. It, it's, just, it's just a guy walking through a forest with a gun in his hand. Like, there's nothing exciting or unique about that game, period. They now have a metric shit ton of publicity because of this. So nobody's getting hurt here, you know? Also, the last time Kojima did this, which was Metal Gear Solid 5, they figured it out in like 45 minutes. <laughs> like, it's never yes. been this elaborate. Stop crediting yeah. elaborate things to this man, despite yeah. his amazing video games. So um, it's, it's a weird situation, yeah. but overall, I think it's just kind of funny, you know? No, no, this isn't kind of funny. That would be Greg Miller. What if it is kind of funny? <gasps> Doo -doo -doo -doo. Anyways, moving on. Um, Ian, 
You know what game you've always yeah. wanted to play on your PS4? No, I don't even want to play it on the consoles. I don't. I don't want to play it on any console. That's ever. right. Hit worst game according to Subpixel. Uh, Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven is back on the PlayStation Store. Forgiveness has been forgiven. You know, CD Projekt Red went over to Sony's house and they had makeup sex, and now they're back on the store. Also, sorry, you broke my you broke my brain a little bit with forgiveness is now forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, I I I didn't pay too much attention to this because I'm pretty sure it was just like a performance patch. Like, sure they probably patched some stuff, but we both know that there are deeper mechanical structural issues with this game that are not going to be fixed now that it's back on the store. Um, but I, I did see Digital Foundry did some analysis, and I was looking at some somebody who released basically like. They released like a video that was a compilation of Cyberpunk on PS4, PS5, Xbox One, and Xbox Series X across like three patches. And the last patch is the one that allowed them back on the PlayStation Store. And there is like a noticeable drop, not just in visual quality, but also <laughs> in the amount of cars and pedestrians in the world. <sighs> like, like they're just, you're walking around like a mostly empty world now, and it looks like it looks like they just dialed all the settings to low, locked it there, and then got rid of like 75% of NPCs. So yeah, sure, it functions a lot better than it did before, but like they they need to take this game out back and shoot it. Just I don't why it's bad. And uh, I we brought this up two weeks ago. It might have been last week, but that that demo, not the bug bug reel, but the demo that got leaked, the internal demo, had more systems and mechanics than the final game. I mean, obviously that's different, but it's just yeah. like what they were going for, they did in no way got there. And no. Nothing if, is helping if, this. Yeah, like I read the Jason Trier book, uh, Press Reset, lately, and, and they have a chapter dedicated to development of Bioshock Infinite. And um you know, it's 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 kind of common knowledge that Bioshock Infinite was basically like rebooted shortly before launch. Um, that they essentially had to go back and remake a lot of the game and cut a lot of content, and rework it into the game that it became, and that kind of worked out for them because I think Bioshock Infinite overall is a good game. Yeah, there's people who love it. I, I wasn't crazy about it, but I don't think it was a bad game. And it feels like with Agreed. Cyberpunk, it's like it's like almost the opposite happened where they hit a point where they realized they needed to rework the game just to get it into a launchable state. And they just started cutting systems, shoving shoving stuff into places. So it's like, you know, these systems were never supposed to interact, but now they have to directly interact. And you just get all these sorts of problems and they never really had time to address performance. Again, this is all conjecture, but I think, I think part of it is also the idea that it's understandable. It happens all the time that a game looks like crap, 99% of the development. And then the last... That last home stretch right before you launch the game, it crystallizes. That's when you optimize the game. That's when you get rid of a lot of the of the of the smaller bugs. That's when all the systems come into play. And I feel like they were just expecting that to happen in terms of performance on the net on the old gen consoles. Yeah. And then by the time they got there, they probably realized that the engine was too advanced or that it was too complicated for them to be able to dial it back to perform properly. So I'm trying to think of a good analogy. I can't think of one, but I think they basically got to a point where they're trying to bring their horse up to the line to run the race and they go well the only way it's going to run the race is if we cut off two of its legs and it's just like it's not going to work you know i i don't think they can dial it back and they there's no way that they're going to be able to put in the amount of effort to bring to finish all the cut systems and bring them back into the game yeah. and i i I hate to say it but they really should just abandon that game they should say whoops sorry we'll do better next time because i think I, there's no way they can redeem this, right? Because even no. even something like No Man's Sky was a functioning game at launch. I would argue it's still not quite fixed, but they've added enough content to make it feel like it's fixed. But Cyberpunk is just like a... At its core, it's broken. Very broken. Every, every way you look at it. Performance, mechanically, like story, it's broken. I can't even see it and being they, fixed by the year anniversary. No, I think it'll still... Not be bad yeah i think they basically have to take that game off the market they have to go back into two years of development minimum and then they re-release it but they would not do that no no so yeah but it is back on the playstation store so you crazy kids also xbox apparently won't buy it 
They extended their be, return window. <laughs> yeah, I want to be very clear. Don't buy that game. I should return. Don't it buy that though. game. Don't buy it. Don't don't play it on old gen. Even if you have a PS4 Pro or a One X, I played it on One X. It's basically unplayable. It loads way too long and it drops down to like 10 frames per second and it has the same stutters and crashes as the next gen version. Buy that game for, I would not pay more than 20 bucks. I I would pay 10. I mean, it gave me like a solid 22 hours. Half enjoyment from that. So I, would, I wouldn't pay more than $10 and only if you have a very beefy PC or you have a PS5 Xbox Series XS. Yeah. Oh boy. Um Let me yeah. talk about this next one. Yeah, go for it. This ties back to Kojima. Basically, um there was a uh portal previous portal developer who had gone to work for Stadia to work on their cloud games. So if you think about Stadia, it's a cloud platform and part of it is just playing normal games through the cloud, but the other part of it is what tech can you take advantage of with a cloud? You have access to more processing power because you can use you know, server hardware versus the the consumer's local hardware. You have, you're dialed into the multiplayer. You have literally hop in, hop out. You don't even have to load. The game can be running on the server in an instance and you lop in, hop in immediately. All sorts of new tech you can take advantage of to make a cloud game that is unique to cloud and doing things that you can't do with a console or PC. Anyway, she was working on those things. She now works for Xbox. They hired her. And according to Jeff Grubb, she has been hired to work with Hideo Kojima on Kojima's Xbox game. Kojima part, not been confirmed, not been announced, but that's the heavy rumor right now. So as the uh, only Death Stranding fan in the entire world, (gasps) and Death Stranding, it's not a cloud game, but it definitely has a lot of cloud features to it in terms of like persistence, you know, people leaving stuff behind for you, messaging, things like that. Well, are you ex- are you excited about this? What do you think a Kojima cloud game would be? Um, yeah, I think it would be another probably iteration of uh, of probably what Death Stranding was more like that. It's not asynchronous. What is it called? It's like the it's the Dark Souls stuff where it's like community to yeah, like persistent yeah, world. persistent yeah. world. It's almost like that. Um, that new roguelike that's coming out battle royale with like the the temple run sort of thing where it's like you're yeah. learning from previous things um yeah so i mean i'm just excited for anything he does anyway so um it'll be interesting i i'm a little worried though because i think i think what i like about xbox's cloud strategy is that it is a free add-on if you have game pass you can play on pc you can play on console if you want to play on cloud they have that for most of their games as well you know, it's not like Stadia or Luna where they're like, look, if you're paying for this, you're only cloud. You don't have any other option. Um, so my slight concern with this is that Xbox is going to do something like put out a cloud only game. I don't think they're going to do that. But if they do, I think that's a misstep because what? the cloud. You Sorry, go ahead. No, I, you finish your thought. I was going to say that the cloud right now is just like a gimmick. As, as game pass it is just like oh i guess if i could i could play on my phone when i'm away from my console but that's not how you want to play the game a majority of the time even a minority of the time yeah. it is last resort so if you make something that is cloud only i think that's a bad idea what is the benefit of making a game cloud only because essentially it's not like i mean you could make it so the game runs off of multiple virtual x or xbox is all and so you have more power and stuff like that but that's not necessarily something they want to feature as having a more powerful thing than being able to play on the most powerful console you know yeah i I think it's mostly that you get rid of the limitations um you could have no loading because you could always have an instance there you know we talked about how you could have more powerful hardware it's 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 kind of like with you know just going back to cyberpunk cyberpunk was developing cross-gen what if they didn't have to that's more resources dedicated to current gen. You don't have to build in limitations. You can do more crazy things. So I, I think that's what you get with the cloud. And I think the other part is that any any services or features they implement with the cloud, like for example, with the cloud, I can immediately hop into your game while you're playing instantly. That feature no longer has parity on a current gen console or next gen console. So gotcha. you're, you're suddenly 
building two versions of the game, you're testing twice, you're figuring out what features are available in which, it just complicates development slightly. So cloud only would just make that a little bit easier if you're focusing on those cloud cloud only features. Gotcha. Makes sense. Yeah, that's exciting. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see. I wonder if that's the main thing Kojima's working on or if he's, that's like, I wonder if that's, there's a game and there's a cloud part of it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, or like the multiplayer's yeah. in the cloud sort of thing. Uh, I could definitely I, see that. Yeah, I think that would be, I think that's what I want is that like Death Stranding, Metal Gear Solid V, uh, you're supposed to say V, right? Not five because it's not five. Is that is that the Metal Gear? Meta no, that that's the that's the it's, that's the fan I'm, theory. Okay. Because it's called Metal Gear um, V because it's about Venom Snake, not yeah. the real spoilers. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's okay. So where you basically have ninety nine percent of it is a normal game, or like Crackdown Three, where ninety nine percent of it is a normal game, but then there are elements of it that use cloud technology to improve it. So with like Crackdown 3, they had their multiplayer was using cloud tech to process the destruction instead of relying on your console. Um, you know, Death Stranding didn't have cloud technology, but you could easily take that that um, multiplayer persistent world and beef it up a lot by having it live on the cloud. So, so my hope is that that's what he's doing is that he's just making a crazy game and he's looking at, he's looking at it like the Psycho Mantis fight where he goes, wait, I can tell which controller is plugged into which port. Let's use that to do something crazy in the game. That, yeah. That's kind of my hope. Okay, great. Um, moving forward, Ian, there, if there's one thing we both love a lot, God. it's ASMR. And if you don't... What did you think was going to happen, Twitch? You freaking morons. Come on. Okay, look. Hot, uh, Twitch meta. Twitch meta update. Okay, right? So, so um, there are streamers who want to do sexually suggestive things because it gets them more money and viewers on Twitch. But they don't want to get banned from Twitch. So previously, they found a loophole, which basically says if you're at the beach or at the pool, then you can wear a bikini or a swimsuit. And so they would put uh, a kiddie pool in their living room and go, look, I'm at the pool. That means I could wear a bikini. And Twitch was like, we don't support sexually suggestive content, but this is A-OK. -okay. And um, turns out too many people doing hot tubs now. So they went to uh, a different uh, loophole, which is ASMR, which is basically making nice noises into your microphone. Um, but they realized, I'm going to use this, this uh, power brick as an example. They realized, I'm going to demonstrate this. This is a oh, video. No. On. They realized. <laughs> We're on YouTube. We can't get. If they did ASMR and they laid on their bed away from the camera with their butt towards the camera yeah. and then grabbed the microphone like this and licked it, that it looked like they were giving a blow job. <laughs> but it's ASMR. It's just, it's just ear licking ASMR. I'm licking your ear. Imagine I'm licking your ear. No, you're licking something else. <laughs> oh, so good. So uh -oh. Twitch, Twitch, Twitch finally found their balls and they're like, no. And they just banned them, including, I think her name is, Amaranth, who is like the top hot yeah. tub streamer and just makes a crap ton of money, she's banned off Twitch now. And because they were finally like, this is this is literally this is sexually suggestive. All the other stuff, I guess, was okay, but now you licking a microphone simulating a blowjob, which is basically the same as what you were doing before with the hot tub, etc., is now all of a sudden wrong. And it's like Twitch, just get rid of all of it. It doesn't belong there. I'm sorry, I'm ranting again. No, it's fine. Something that's not in this article, but I had heard is they had posted their OnlyFans links in the Twitch chat as well, which Twitch used in part to put the ban on them. Um, Look, I, I'm, I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with Twitch using that as an excuse because that means they didn't find their balls. Right. It's like ban them for sure. sexually suggestive content, not because they're linking to the OnlyFans. Both of them should be bannable offenses. Yes. Not just one of them. Um. Oh, yeah, boy. Yeah, Twitch. Come on, Twitch. We all like video games. Um, oh, sorry. I spent most of that story looking up Death Stranding Collector's Edition to see if the price has gone down anymore, but it's actually gone back up. So I should have bought it when it was ninety, but that's okay. Um, uh, moving on here, folks. Uh, I don't. So this next story, I'll just do a quick hit. EA yeah. has acquired Playdemic. 
which is the developers of Golf Clash on mobile from Warner Brothers Games and AT&T for $1.4 billion in cash. I've never heard of Golf Clash. Have you Me heard neither. of that? Apparently, it's the um, most popular golf mobile game. Yeah, and I could see it making a ton on monetization. Uh, I think the only interesting tidbit here was that it's Warner Brothers Games spinning out one of their studios. And if you remember a couple of weeks ago, they were bought up by Discovery Media and split out from AT&T. So it was one of those things where it's like, what's going to happen to all those WB studios? But they also released a statement basically saying, we liked working with Playdemic, but they don't really fit in with our strategy anymore because we want our video games to focus on Warner Brothers IP. So it sounds like the Warner Brothers game studios are actually kind of in a secure place going forward, at least for now, and that this is just a one-off spinoff where they, they had a studio that didn't really make sense for them to hold on to anymore, so they got rid of it. Yeah. Um, uh, and then uh, yeah. Yeah, finally... What's this one? What's this one? I, I saw this today. I just thought it was interesting. I wanted to mention it quickly, mostly because some of our documentaries oh. have covered Halo modding. Uh, so they added on Steam modding tools for Halo Combat Evolved to the Master Chief Collection, uh, which is a completely separate program. Uh, you can get in there. You can make new levels. You can edit existing levels, all sorts of stuff. Um, it does say they're providing the tools as is. So I think they're just adding in the modding tools um, uh -huh. that are already available through other means. But I, I thought that was cool. It's sort of like an official sort of acknowledgement of how big the modding community is. On, yeah, but on so the crazy scale. thing is, you know, you know, the Halo CE mod community, we have an entire documentary on this. It's my understanding that they've kind of had to build their own tools, you know, kind of like unpack game files, modify them, bring it back in. But there's a line in here in this uh, Master Chief Collection blog post on Steam that basically says, this entirely new program is basically a development build of the game itself. This program is meant for advanced modification only. So I feel like this is just like a brand new gift to the mod community saying like, hey, here's a brand new program you wrote. I don't know if it's actually going to make it easier for them, but it's crazy to see them add like literally a brand new mod tool for Halo CE. That's, I, I mean, I feel, look, if we, if we were actual journalists, then we would get in touch with our Halo CE mod community fans and ask them what they think of it. Cause I'd be curious to see if they say like, this is a godsend or it's nice gesture, but we already have most of these tools are better. You know, I'm just kind of curious what the mod community reaction to it is, but, but still cool nonetheless. Yeah, it's really neat. So I just threw that in here just to check it out. Uh, and with that, we are done with the news this week. There were a couple other stories that I, I didn't throw on here um, just because they weren't that interesting. Or if they were interesting, they were covered by people who were better than us. Um, moving on, Ian Gibson. Are, are you ready to get your ear licked? I'm licking your ear, Will. I'm going to lick your ear. Oh, let me face this way. Oh. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> stupid twitch uh, god uh, I would laugh so hard if that girl's only fans she still didn't get fully naked <laughs> 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 um okay uh it is time for the subpixel rating system folks we have 32 games on here 30 games on here <laughs> I'm going to, Ian had a bright idea, so I'm going to read through them now. And then at the end, uh, I won't read through them. I'll just mention the ones that were updated. Um, so there are, oh, that's why. Okay. Here is the current subpixel rating system. Number one, Outer Wilds. Number two, Yakuza 0. Number three, Titanfall 2. Number four, Factorio. Number five, Doom 1993. Number six, Half-Life. Number seven, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Number eight, Red Dead Redemption. Number nine, Firewatch. Ten is Mirror's Edge. Eleven, Ghost of Tsushima. Twelve, Control. Thirteen, Mass Effect 2. Fourteen, Cuphead. Fifteen, Prey. Sixteen, Shadow of the Colossus. Seventeen, Star Wars Battlefront 2004. Eighteen, Horizon Zero Dawn. Nineteen, Battlefield 1943. Twenty, Middle Dash Earth, colon, Shadow of Mordor. 21, The Outer Worlds. Twenty-two, Gone Home. Twenty-three, Fallout 4. Twenty-four, Fallout Sorry, 23, Halo 4, 24, Fallout 4, 
25 No Man's Sky, 26 DayZ, 27 Donkey Kong 64, 28 Brink, 29 Kingdom Hearts 3, and 30, the worst game of all time according to us, currently Cyberpunk 2077. Um, sorry, reading Ghost of Tsushima Sushi, reminded me they just announced uh, Ghosts of, I can't remember the name, standalone expansion for that game. Was that was that announced or was that just a rumor? Oh, you're right. It might have been a leak rumor. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ian, do you want to kick us off here? Yeah, it just reminds me that I, I listened to the podcast last week and two things stood out to me. Number one, you guys dragged me a lot. <laughs> Number two, I really enjoyed it. It was a great episode. <laughs> um, I can't believe you guys put Titanfall 2 that high, though. That's a good campaign. I look, I don't want to react to it, but I will just say, I think you're forgetting that campaign was like five hours long. Like it was great, but it was, it was tacked on. And the other thing is Titanfall multiplayer. It's okay, but it's got flaws. So that, that, that kind of limits it in my mind where I'm like, it's a great game, but it's not quite, not quite full game. Anyways, um, <laughs> not going to react. Yet. Look folks, it's happened. We need to talk about Mass Effect 2. Specifically, I need to talk about uh, it because I beat the game and I get to put it wherever I want on the list. Look, here is we that what we it. decided? Yeah, it is. It's on there. Pending Ian beating the game. Yep. So here's uh, the thing. I went into Mass Effect 2 expecting to, to I wouldn't say expecting to love it, but expecting it to be a lot better than Mass Effect 1. And I think at the end of the day, I think it's about the same as Mass Effect 1. And I, I, I think it's almost like a chart, you know, like competing bar charts where it's like, okay, well, the combat's better in Mass Effect 2, but the story's a lot better in Mass Effect 1. Mass Effect 2 has better side content, but it's not quite as well like laid out or paced as Mass Effect 1. And um, like, I still think Mass Effect 2 is a good game, mm -hmm. but I mean, like, I don't want to get into nitty gritty specifics here, but like... We talked previously about how I felt like there was too much side stuff going on, and we thought it maybe because there's like DLC content that's being presented as mainline content. I think that contributed to it, but honestly, I think the bigger thing is that there's basically like four main story missions in that game, like four or five. Like there's very little main story. Yeah. Um, and I think that really hurts the game because the first game was very strong on story, and that's kind of how you met all your comrades, etc. And the second game is very heavy on the side content and the main story is so little and it does almost nothing to carry the, the overarching Mass Effect story forward. It's almost like a clone of the first game where it's like, here's a random throwaway race that is proxy for the real enemy and you're barely going to learn anything more about the real enemy. Like in the first game, you're learning all this stuff, but there's still questions. And the second game, you're just like, I think you maybe learn like one tidbit more. And then there's like a lot. None of the other questions are answered, and then there's just a bunch of side content. So, in terms of putting it on this list, I think it's a very good game, but it's got some flaws to it. I still, I still did enjoy it. So right now it is number 13. It is below control and above Cuphead. I think that if I... If I were to put this on the list at its true objective final spot, not final, but Mass Effect 2 belongs at, oh, this is dirty. It belongs at number 13, below control and above <laughs> Cuphead. <laughs> I'm not moving it. It's the right spot. As you were talking about it, I was reading the list and I was like, I mean, I might move it up. I would probably put it above Mirror's Edge, but I couldn't see you putting I, it below Cuphead. And I wouldn't put it above Control. I don't think you would put it above Control either, would you? I, I would put it above Control. I, I have a lot of nostalgia and like stuff yeah. attached to it. I think I, I just I think there's I think it's not as big of a when we first put it on the list, wasn't it like number five or number six? I think the problem is that yeah. we've padded the list out a lot with a lot of bullshit, like Ghost of Tsushima is above it, and Titanfall 2 is above it. Outer <laughs> Wilds, we all put above it, but that needs to go somewhere else. So Ugh. it's one of those things where it's like, it's, it's number 13 out of 30 right now. So I'm okay with that. 
did you have a game you wanted to uh to bring up uh i was trying to decide if i was gonna add a game or uh i i'm gonna force your hand i'm gonna say something add a game i'm gonna say add a game because we we got to get to 50 so this segment can go to the graveyard I'm going to add Kerbal Space Program. <gasps> okay. Kerbal Space Program it... is an excellent simulator of what it is to run a space agency, go into space, change orbits, go to different places, land on moons. It's very accurate, very good. It's a little janky with some of the physics, uh, but no one had really done anything like it before. Um, and they kind of took their niche and ran with it and brought a lot of, I mean, there was that big movement of bringing science to the public. Uh, Mythbusters is one of those people who are huge proponents of it. And I would argue Kerbal is a huge proponent of that, especially for astronomy and NASA and science and space exploration. Um, I mean, you can play these games on the console. I've never done it, but I heard it's possible. Um, that's just crazy. Today, Today is the 10th anniversary of the game. Uh, and they just came out with the 10th anniversary update. It's fantastic. They're moving forward on Kerbal 2. All hands on deck for that now. Um, they've added a lot of stuff people finally wanted. Ian, this will interest you. But you can start building actual bases on other planets now. Um, hmm. They added like official attachment points to the ground. Yeah. Um, so that's neat. Uh, I'm looking forward to. I'm. I still love playing it, even though I'm god awful at it. Today, my rocket did a backflip on its way up, which is what all rockets need to do. Um. So I, yes, I I love Kerbal, but I need to play um, Doubles Advocate here, and this is a very good sandbox game. It is. It is kind of a terrible non-sandbox game. They've tried adding a campaign. And it has some good tutorial missions, but it's just like this weird thing where it's like, yeah, I guess if you do this, then you get like this weird science credit, which lets you unlock new parts. Yeah. They have have yet to fix the physics system. And by that, I mean, you could have a rocket where nothing's crazy. Everything is perfectly attached to each other. But as it goes up, it just wobbles and it just eventually breaks apart. Yeah, you could just do this and then it breaks apart. Um, and uh, for yeah, the listener, I'm doing some <laughs> I'm doing some real on brand Twitch gesturing, if you get my drift. Um, the other thing is like, <laughs> hey, no more ASMR licking. Sorry. Um, the other thing is they rely a lot on mods because there are a lot of quality life, quality of life stuff that is not great in this game. Um, so I think I think they built a great skeleton of a game here, and I think they did a lot better than like Daisy or No Man's Sky in terms of adding content and building onto it and like improving things, but I don't think it's nearly enough. So it's still a fantastic rocket sandbox game, but uh, it's a lot of, you get what you put, you get yeah. out of it, what you put into it. Definitely. The game, not to say that the game is difficult, but you are going to be looking stuff up. You're going to be starting to install some mods. You're going to be making your own challenges because even though the game tries to guide you certain ways to do certain things, it's really just a sandbox game. So that being said, where would you put it? I would put it at new number 17. Okay, so above Star Wars Battlefront 2004, but below Shadow of the Colossus? Yes. I would put it higher. I mean, I would have... I, 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 because I'm looking at... I'm going, look, Mass Effect 2... It's it's a good game, but Kerbal, like, I think I have like 110 hours in Kerbal. Like, just to kind of go back on what I said is like, that is, it's easy to put 20, 20 hours into Mass Effect 2 because that's the main storyline, but to play 110 hours of a sandbox game where you don't have explicit goals, but you just keep building stuff and having fun. I think that speaks a lot to it. Yeah, so I, I think the issue I kind of want to put it higher. The, the issue is I didn't want to put it above Shadow. I, I don't think it goes above Shadow of Colossus, but I think Shadow of Colossus is in the wrong spot. So yeah, playing that card, if Shadow of Colossus wasn't there, I would probably put it above Mass Effect Two. 
So number 13, below control, above Mass Effect 2? Yeah. I, I'm okay with that. I like that. I'm okay with that. Okay. Folks, I have another game. What's the other game? I feel a little bad for Cyberpunk. Look, it's a very bad game. But there are good parts of it. And I think the intention of this list of making a true 1 to 10 scale has gotten away from us. And it's kind of just become a argue for your favorite game type of list. And I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. But I think we're forgetting that there are games worse than Cyberpunk 2077. <laughs> That's are why there... we need to talk about we need to talk about big rigs over the road racing. Oh no. Have you played this game, Will? Uh I've never actually played it. I've seen it played. I I have played it. This is a game that's kind of like trash software, like you would buy it off the Walmart shelf in the I think early two thousands or the late nineties. Um it was reviewed by Alex Navarro on GameSpot in uh 2004 the game came out in 2003 kind of gained some popularity because of how bad his review was this game is just flat out broken it's uh, i'll give you an example like you can drive through most of the terrain um it's supposed to be like a truck racing game but the ui is weird i think there's only like two or three maps you can drive through mountains if you go backwards there's no max speed so you can just reverse and go like <laughs> two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred miles per hour. This is like a truly terrible, broken game. And I think it's the easiest game we've ever put on this list at the very bottom. I'll put it there. Big race what? over the road racing. Brand new number 32. Wow. Who to think? Who to thought we'd have... Well, actually, the two worst games on this list submitted by Ian. Um, that's telling. That's true. Do we do we have time for a third game? I you know because we only discussed two. What what else would you like to add, my dear? You know what? Let's let's talk about Mario Tennis for the N sixty four. Oh God. We played it recently. This game, I, I want to be upfront with this. This game doesn't have a lot. It just has a couple different courts. It has some tournaments and it has, I believe, 16 characters. I believe two or four of which are hidden until you beat certain modes. Kind of like Mario Kart 64, where it's like most of the content is there, but you got to unlock it a little bit. But we played Mario Tennis again recently. And we had like a 25 minute three person match. That game still feels and plays phenomenal considering it's not complicated. Like, like if you think about like, it's not dumbed down like we, like we, we sports tennis, but it's also doesn't have all these mechanics like uh, power tennis, which came out for the switch, which had like, a, there's like super smash moves and there's like a fighting game mechanic in terms of like blocking, defending, et cetera, zones. Mario Tennis is very simple. I think there's just, what, two? I think there's two buttons to hit the ball. There's movement, and then there's, like, a little bit of a... There's, like, a star that goes on the ground, which means, like, you could try and do a smash from that location. And then there's the perfect timing on the serve. And then each character has a little bit of slot. So there's not a whole lot of mechanics at play. But it feels so good. Am I wrong, Will? Doesn't it feel great? It feels really good. The only thing was I played with the AI guy, and that did not feel good. That's right, because we were playing doubles. It was Karen and I versus Will and Bowser, and the Bowser AI was not great. It, it was but... good, but the problem is every time I approached the center, he wouldn't be able to decide to go after a ball or not. So often yeah. it was me having to run. So, I mean, you could mitigate it, but that was a huge bummer. I, I think, like, I played this game a lot. I think I got an N64 a couple years after it came out. So I played it a lot then. Every couple years I come back to it and I play it a lot. And we, like I said, we picked it up and had like a 30 minute intense edge of our seat, screaming, sweating, one minute volley matches. And it was just, it felt really, really good. And I think a lot of N64 games don't feel good. And this one still feels real good. So in terms of where it goes on the list. Oh boy. Okay. Look, I'm just, sorry. I'm just looking at it, folks. And I think it goes... Oh, you see me clicking. <laughs> I think <laughs> I was gonna say. 
I think it goes at the new number 19 below Star Wars oh. Battlefront 2004 and above, and above Horizon Zero Dawn. I, I mean, all those reasons you mentioned are the reasons I love Battlefront 2004, and I'm glad, I'm glad you put it below it. <laughs> I, I think they're very similar. It's just Battlefront has a little bit more content in that apples to orange comparison about, we have to do. I agree. I'm going to just put this here. And I want to play Battlefront 2004. That game still quick resumed on my Xbox. That's crazy. From May 3rd. <laughs> um, I'm just looking up real quick. Mario Tennis, I think. Yeah, I, I double checked the name. It is Mario Tennis. Okay, because the Game Boy Advance one is something different. Yeah, and Aces is the Switch one. And then yeah, I th- yeah. think there's a GameCube one too. Yeah, I think it's like Power Server or something. Yeah. It's not. It's not as good because it, it, when they introduce the powers, I it's not quite. It, just give me the tennis, baby. Yeah. Um. Okay. So new number thirteen Kerbal Space Program. Uh, Mass Effect got knocked down to fourteen, but it stayed where it was after Ian's impressive playthrough of it. Uh, new number. Uh, sorry, nineteen Mario Tennis. And a new number, 33 Big Rigs Over the Road Racing, worse than Cyberpunk 2077. That's surprising. Uh, but did not win the Battle of the Beat Brink. Uh, so, hearts out there. Um, I think that's it, Ian. I think that's the show. What are you you're typing? Yeah, I just, you know, I was so looking forward to this. I knew it was going to be a good show. I've been off two weeks. I had the whole I bought a house thing. I think we knocked it out of the park, buddy. Just the two of us. Let's go to a one person next week. I'll take care of it. Yeah, you can take care of it. Folks, thank you for tuning in to Local Chat. You know, I had a blast. I love doing this podcast, even though it's it gets really hot in here when I don't have the fans on or the AC on. So I sweat for you. Um, we talked about a lot of good stuff today, but what we didn't talk about you can go find a subpixelfilms.com that'll bring straight to our YouTube channel where you can check out all of our past shows and past things. Also, there's the subpixel streams, YouTube channel. We can check out, check out our past archives as well. Uh, also there's a link below join our uh, community discord where you can hang out. You can go view the council of Carl's channel where both Carl's just talk to each other uh, and have a great time in there. Um, I am glad that you guys had a good time. <clears throat> um, okay, sorry. I was a, I got a Discord notification. I was afraid you were sending me something I was doing wrong. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Hunt270. You can find only fans. Ian on Twitter at Think Gibson. You can find him on OnlyFans at the Old Wrinkly Man. Um, <laughs> I wonder if that's someone. Uh, what else? I'm not gonna look it up. <laughs> no, me neither. Let's not go to that. Ronald McDonald vomiting. Um, <laughs> folks, <laughs> thank you for tuning in. I hope you had a good time listening. If you didn't, please let us know in the comments. Please leave a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this. Zach, I see you in the chat. Bye, babies. And everybody, we will see you next week. <laughs>